Welcome to the TED interview. I'm Chris Anderson. This is the podcast series where I sit down with a TED speaker and we get to dive much deeper into their ideas than was possible during their TED talk. My guest this episode is Yuval Harari. Now, he's a historian and a futurist. And his books have wowed so many people because of the sweeping way in which they connect our past and our future. Yuval thinks that humans have gotten to where we are in large part because of our ability to, as he puts it, create fictions, to tell stories and to share those stories. We can cooperate because we alone, of all the animals on the planet, can create and believe fictional stories. A human can say, look, there is a God above the clouds. And if you don't do what I tell you to do, after you die, God will punish you and send you to hell. This is something only humans can do. You can never convince a chimpanzee to give you a banana by promising him that after you die, you'll go to chimpanzee heaven. No chimpanzee will ever believe such a story. Yuval has a story about the future that is profound, exciting, but also unsettling. He thinks that the disillusionment that many of us feel right now is actually to a large part misconceived. It's not that we shouldn't be worried, but we're actually worried about the wrong things. There lie ahead of us much deeper dangers. Uh, dangers that actually could even spell the end of civilization as we know it. Over the next hour, we'll talk about some of those dangers and about why Yuval thinks we've gotten to where we are and what we can do to prepare for the coming challenges. Yuval Harari, welcome. It's good to be here. So you have this extraordinary way of connecting history with every issue that is relevant today, I think. And you, you seem to do it by the way you describe history as this history of narratives of the stories that humans have told themselves, which, which I think you argue is, is really humanity's superpower. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear what you think of the narrative we're telling ourselves today. There's basically, I think in your, in your book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, you talk about a disillusionment that's happened. How would you describe that narrative that we're telling ourselves today? We don't have a narrative. <laughs> I mean, we are in this quite unique and frightening situation when we don't have a story to explain to ourselves what is happening in the world and where we are heading. Uh, in the 20th century, we had three big narratives, th three big stories that really explained everything. The past, the present, the future. You had the fascist story, which said that the whole of human history is a struggle between nations and one human group, one nation, one race will violently dominate the entire world. And the second story was the communist story. Communism said, no, 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 no. History is not a struggle among nations. History is a struggle among classes. Everything that happened for thousands of years is a struggle among classes. And the future, the communist vision for the future, was that one social system will dominate the whole world, ensuring equality between all people, even at the price of freedom. And then the third story was the liberal story, which basically said history is not a struggle between nations or between classes. It's a struggle between liberty and tyranny. And the liberal vision for the future was a peaceful cooperation between different groups of people with some inequality, but with maximum freedom. Or with freedom is the main thing, and we can take inequality as, as the inevitable price of that. And... You can see the 20th century is a struggle between these three stories. One by one, they get knocked out. Fascism is knocked out in the Second World War. Then the Cold War knocks out communism. And at the end of the 20th century, we reach the end of history, when the liberal story is the only one remaining. And uh, so, so we had these three stories, and then two stories, and then just one story. There is just one story that explains everything. This is the, the most reassuring situation, and then it collapses, which is what is happening over the last 10 years, five years. And we don't have a new big story that explains what is happening and where we are going. So 
Talk, talk about the current disillusionment. I mean, what caused the blowing up of the liberal story? And actually, Yuval, before we go too far down the street, I, I just want some more clarity on yeah, the, yeah. the liberal story, because mm -hmm. the word liberal is understood differently by other people. In the UK, there's a party called the liberals. Yeah. There's, it's, it's understood differently. By liberal, you mean the term pretty broadly in a way yes. that actually encompasses, for example, both George W. Bush, Barack Exactly. Obama. George W. Bush, is, in historical terms... He is a liberal. Most Trump supporters are also liberals in the historical sense. I mean, I, mean, I know that in the U.S., when people say liberal, they have in mind gay marriage, gun control, abortion, all these things. But historically speaking, it's much, much broader. Defi define it. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe I'll say something about the word liberal. It simply comes from liberty. It's the idea that liberty is the most important value in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the personal sphere. So in the political sphere, again, from a broad historical perspective, thinking in terms of centuries and not decades, if you think that political power should come from the people and not from some king or from God or something like that, then you're a liberal. And then you have the economic field, And there, the idea is that people should be free to choose their professions, their products, what to buy, what to work, uh, economic liberty. If you think that people should have the freedom to choose their own professions, their own careers, you're an economic liberal. Mm. So you have the political field, the economic field, and then you have the personal field. So here the test is, if you think that people should be free to choose whom to marry, then again, you're a liberal. This is where it gets confusing, I think, the term liberal a little bit for some people, because people, mm -hmm. there's a lot of conservatives who would accept the first two definitions of liberal and would, would embrace that. But um, perhaps until recently, many of those people would not have accepted liberal guidance on, on the very personal side. And so... Yeah, I mean, but even if you look at the, at the personal field, I think even most hardline Republicans are in favor of marrying from love and from your own personal choices and are not in favor of fixed marriages. Hmm. I think that most Republican voters did not marry somebody who was chosen for them without their consent and participation by their parents or by the elders. Hmm. So when you get to something like gay marriage, if my choice is to marry somebody from my own gender, then some people say, okay, th that's where the line, I, I draw the line. But compared to the situation a century ago, I think that most Republican voters a century ago would have been considered like extreme hippies. They would have been like on the extreme liberal end of the, of the spectrum. So there's uh, definitely on the personal sphere, there's been this massive shift of um, opinion over mm -hmm. time. And um, you can think of the liberal story as a broad one. There's lots of detail in there. But basically, a version of that story encompassing politics, economics, and personal yes. became the winning ideology mm -hmm. of, say, from 1990 or whatever onwards. But, um, but it kind of, you know, after 20 years, boom, ran into massive problems. Describe what happened. Um, what are the reasons is, is difficult to say, especially because many of the promises of kind of the liberal story were fulfilled. The world is still full of problems, but compared to any previous time in history, it, uh, according to many measurements, we never had it better. I mean, if people think, no, liberalism has done a really bad job, we want to go back to some pre-liberal golden age, I would just like to know which year they have in mind. If you think the world of the early 21st century is a bad place to live in, what are you dreaming about? The mm. 1950s, the 1850s, are you dreaming about going back to the 13th century? If you look at, at statistics about things like child mortality, like uh, uh, epidemics, like famine, For humans, not for the planet, not for the ecological system, but for human beings, uh, the early 21st century is the best time to live. So, so as a historian almost, what I hear you saying is that there's almost a, a human psychological bug where we are wildly prone to nostalgia and to actually to mm -hmm. false stories about the past. We, we uh, don't remember the bad stuff. We have a tendency to focus on recent problems that hit us now. Mm -hmm. And we're not really comparing... Uh, like with like, and, and, uh, and that can be dangerous, actually. Yeah, I mean, if you say, if, if you like family values, just consider going back 200 years to a situation when you have six kids 
and four of them die before they reach 20. If you care about family and about children, would you like to live in such a world? And I, th- I think most people won't, but they just don't remember because they, they weren't alive. So they don't take this into account. And when I try to understand, so what is the, 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 the deep reason for this disillusionment and backlash against the, the, the liberal order? So one option is that this is actually limited to um, largely the Western core countries were in relative terms, even though their situation also improved, in comparison to people in in India or in China, uh, the gap has has shrunk. And because these are still the most powerful countries in the world, especially the US, when people in the US feel miserable, the entire world shakes. (laughs) Uh, The world feels the pain of people in Kentucky and Pennsylvania far, far more than it feels the pain of people in Brazil or in India. Is that because media stories originate from the US? Or, or it's not just media. That? You know, the, the US is a powerful country in the world in economic terms, in uh, military terms, in cultural terms. So um, the resentment of people here translates into political and economic steps Mm -hmm. which have a huge impact on all the world. Whereas if you live in uh, uh, Sudan and you are resentful, there is whatever you do, it's unlikely to have such an impact on the rest of the world. So if people in in, in Sudan or people in the Philippines feel pain, Mm -hmm. the world usually ignores them. But if people in Kentucky or people in Indiana feel pain, the entire world uh, pays attention. And you have now this, like people in Silicon Valley, people in the, in, the, in the top universities, they're constantly thinking, why are people in Indiana and Kentucky resentful? And how much of the explanation of that is just almost the simple economic one, that the world came to believe in free trade, almost like a religion. It was mm-hmm. like, this is the way that you maximize overall economic growth. So all these trade agreements were put into a place to allow that. Pipes effectively were connecting the US and and Europe with the rest of the world. And it it allowed the the immediate sort of outsourcing of a lot of of jobs so that um, uh, hundreds of millions of jobs were created in the developing world, but they probably displaced Mm -hmm. tens of millions of jobs in Europe and the US and and, and led to this sort of plateauing of income and 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 hope for the future that, mm-hmm. that has been ended up being quite quite destructive. Is, is that is that a core part of the narrative there? I, I think that's part of the story that, you know, f- for two centuries, Britain and the United States and other Western powers have uh, pushed the entire world in the name of free trade and globalization because it worked very well for people in Britain and the US. And suddenly, when it works well for China and India, but works less well for the USA, they say, no, 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 forget about it. All the stuff we said about free trade and globalization, we don't want it any- anymore. Uh, so that's, that's part of the story. But I, I still think it, it, there is something deeper than that. I don't know. I mean, we need a lot of, of research and empirical data to back up or disprove what I am about to say. So take it just as an idea, as an hypothesis, not as kind of a, of a full-fledged uh, explanation. But I think part of what is going on, on maybe a deeper level of, 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 of the human mind, is that people sense, a lot of people sense, that they are being left behind and left out of the story, even if their material conditions are still relatively good. In the 20th century, what was common to all the stories, the liberal, the fascist, the communist, is that the big heroes of the story were the common people. Not necessarily all people, but if you lived, say, I don't know, in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, life was very grim. But when you looked at the propaganda posters on the walls that depicted the glorious future, you were there. You looked at the posters which showed steel workers and farmers in, 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 in heroic poses. And it was obvious that this is the future. 
Now, when people look at the posters on the walls or, or listen to TED Talks, they hear a lot of, you know, these big ideas mm. and big words about machine learning and genetic engineering and blockchain and globalization. And, and they are not there. Mm. They are no longer part of the story of the future. And I think that if I, again, this is an hypothesis. If I try to understand and to connect to the deep resentment of people in many places around the world, part of, of what might be going there is people realize, and they are correct in thinking that, that the future doesn't need me. You have all these smart people in California and in New York and in Beijing, and they are planning this amazing future with artificial intelligence and bioengineering and, and global connectivity and whatnot, and they don't need me. So maybe if they are nice, they will throw some crumbs my way, like universal basic income. But it's, it's much worse psychologically to feel that you are useless than mm. to feel that you are exploited. So talk about this, because this is, this is one of the key ideas that you have been extremely articulate about. Talk about how, how you see technology shifting how things work and, and actually mm -hmm. realizing those fears or, or risking realizing those fears even more deeply than you think people feel. Mm -hmm. So on, on one level, you know, it's, it's the economic and military realities. If you go back to the middle of the 20th century, and it doesn't matter if you're in the United States with Roosevelt, or if you're in Germany with Hitler, or if you're in, in, in the USSR with Stalin, and you think about building the future, then your building materials are those millions of people who are working hard in the factories, in the farms, the soldiers in the... You need them. You don't have any kind of future without them. Hmm. Um, and now fast forward to, to the early 21st century when we just don't need the vast majority of the population. Because? Because uh, the, the future is about developing more and more sophisticated technology like, again, artificial intelligence, bioengineering. Most people don't contribute anything to that except perhaps for their data. And whatever people are still doing, which is useful, these technologies increasingly will make redundant and will make it possible to, to replace the, the people. I mean, that's obviously, you know, there's a lot of debate um, about this. Some people feel that actually technologies, including artificial intelligence, will empower people simply to do more, more interesting work. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly technology can empower. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a radiologist who, you know, here's an AI that detects... Um, patterns of cancer better than they do, but perhaps they can become a sort of strategist mm -hmm. and sort of, um, you know, move their work to a higher level and figure out what is the wisest diseases to direct radiology into and, and, and use, these, use these things as tools, and therefore the work actually gets more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, the counter warning to that? I, I agree there will be many new and exciting jobs for humans. The problem is that it's not clear that many humans will be able to do them. Um, because they will require high skills and uh, a lot of education. So a lot of humans will be left behind, even if there are new jobs. Again, taking the historical perspective, if you look, look back at what's happening in the 1920s and 1930s, so you have technology coming in and displacing a lot of people from traditional jobs in farming. So you don't need a hundred farmers on this, on this farm, you just need two tractors and a couple of, of, of mechanics and drivers. That's it. So you have 90 farmers displaced. But then they just move to the city, they move to Detroit, or they move to Stalingrad and start working in the tractor factory. In, in that way, they are still part of the future. But what we are talking about now with the rise of, of AI and machine learning and all that is that a lot of jobs will be replaced and the new jobs will demand high skills and a lot of retraining. When you left your farm in, I don't know, Minnesota and moved to Detroit to work in the factory, it, it's always difficult to change your profession and, and your life. But 
to learn the job of uh, a factory hand in, in this big factory in Detroit, you could do it at age 35 or 45 in a couple of weeks or a couple of months and, it, and you will be okay. And similarly, if you lose your job in the factory and you move to the supermarket, it's still possible to do that without a lot of education and without a lot of free training. But if you lose your job as a truck driver or as a factory worker, and people come and say, "Ah, oh, but wonderful, we have all these new jobs, uh, uh, engineering software in California, or building virtual reality games. How are you going to do that? So again, t- trying to desperately to sort of apply some sort of um, more hopeful spin on that. Um, and in fact, you do this yourself in your book at one point. Um, a lot of the jobs that are being displaced are actually kind of boring jobs. They don't really tap into the core of what a human is. They, 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 they kind of treat <coughs> humans a bit as sort of robotic things that, mm-hmm. that you pay the money and, and, and they will do the same thing again and again. And, you know, we, we can aspire to more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the question is, is there more that you, you can do? And, and certainly, you know, viewed through the lens you talked about, about existing jobs, you can see them sort of um, being divided up between, you know, technology and super skilled humans. And so that's mm-hmm. scary. But, but when you step back, I mean, there's no shortage of things that need to be done. I mean, apart from anything else, you know, the world's full of millions of lonely people right mm-hmm. right now. Um, people are really good at making lonely people not feel lonely yeah. if they want to. And pretty much anyone can, can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, communities are a mess. Pretty much anyone who lives somewhere could do, in principle, something to make a community better. They could paint a fence or, mm-hmm. or you know, do some voluntary service or, or whatever. I, I, I wonder to what extent... We're just going to have to completely rethink what it is to work, what it is to live, okay. and, and, and find different stories. That perhaps we all have to, to start to figure out a way of taking away this sort of jobs as the central mm-hmm. goal of an economy and, and find some other language. Yeah, or redefine what a job is. Um, if we can redefine building communities or raising kids mm. as a very important job, and maybe it is the most important job of all, and pay for that, then many of these dystopian scenarios will not come true. The question is, is society willing to to switch its definitions and especially pay for these things? Um, Yes, I mean, if if we can do that, then that's a much brighter future. Uh, So so we have the path of retraining people, Hmm. which costs a lot of money and effort. We have the path of... uh, recognizing activities like community building and like raising families as jobs that uh, maybe the government is paying for. And that also solves a lot of the problems. But for that, we need a new economic and and social model. Mm. So I'm definitely not saying that things are hopeless. There is nothing that can be done to to stop the worst case scenarios. There There are many things we can do, but it's not going to be easy because we need a new economic and social model. So yeah, so this question of who pays and how seems crucial because um, in the course to this future, certainly more wealth will be created, but it's going to be aggregated by the companies who are, who are using the technology. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're losing workers and, and jobs, making their products more profitably. There's, there's more wealth there, but there's no agreement on, on how that wealth could ever move to, for example, pay a mother or someone who was working in a in a community. Mm-hmm. Do you see any solution to that problem other than somehow governments just insisting on on greater tax distribution from from yeah, the very I mean, that's rich that's the traditional role of government to when the market isn't efficient enough in redistributing the the, the wealth then this is the job of the, of the government. How exactly to do that? I'm not an economist, so I don't know how, how to answer that. It's, it's basically a political question. We need some political consensus ab- around that. But I would say that the biggest problem by far is not on the national level, it's on the global level. Hmm. I think that Americans will be okay. And I think also that the Chinese will be okay because the USA and China are leading this revolution and they will dominate the, probably the economy in, in the coming decades. And more and more wealth will flow to the US and to China. Um, so there's still going to be political battles within the United States about how exactly to redistribute the wealth, but they have something to redistribute. If you think about other countries, if you look down south, 
את מקסיקו, את הונדורס, את אלסלבדור, את ברזיל. I think that the situation is far, far worse. I mean, I can easily envision a future in which the government taxes uh, the, the, the tech giants in California to pay mothers in Pennsylvania and in Indiana. I don't see a future when they take some of that money and send it to Honduras or Mexico or Brazil. Hmm. And so the question is, what will the people there do? So if people now in, in Honduras work as textile workers and truck drivers, and these jobs are gone, because in 20 years or 30 years, it's cheaper to produce textiles in the US than in Honduras, because you cut the human element out of the equation. So mm. what will people in Honduras do? I mean, I've heard a few tech optimists talk about the, the possibility for many millions of jobs being created, basically to help train the um you know the the algorithms the the artificial intelligence that we're creating like it only gets smart by by virtue of exposure to millions and millions of data points and many of those have to be input by humans so that mm-hmm. they reflect our our insights our, our our knowledge or whatever but it it doesn't like it feels like that even if that is something it won't be something forever that 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 technology goes through a cycle like ais get to a point where you Initially, they, they rely on machine learning, and then at some point, they, they, they kind of teach each other, or they just, you know, they learn from their yeah, own simulation. And, and, and even that, I guess, there will, again, there will be a lot of jobs, but where? I mean, there will be a lot of jobs in the AI industry, but I guess most of these jobs will be in California and not in Honduras or Mexico. So it's, it's not really a, a relevant answer. It's not really a relevant solution. I mean, you still need the data, the data points, mm-hmm. as you say, to train the AI, at least for some period. But here the danger is that we might see a kind of data colonization, a little parallel to what we've seen with the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the model in the 19th century, uh, let's say for Britain and its colonies, is that you grow cotton in Egypt You send the raw cotton from Egypt to Britain. They're the really important and, and, and profitable business of producing textiles. This was the high tech of the 19th century was the textile industry. So you send the raw materials of cotton from Egypt to uh, Manchester. You produce the shirt in Manchester and then you send it back to Egypt to be sold. And most of the profits are, of course, in Manchester. And we might see the same thing with the data economy. that you harvest data, let's say in Mexico, you send the raw data to California, it's being processed there, the uh, uh, high-tech products of AI are being produced in California, and then you send back the finished good to be sold in Mexico, and the vast majority of profits are therefore in California. And the only thing that the, the data colony contributes is is the initial data which it has no control over and therefore it gets a v- just a very small part of, of the profits. So there's, there's obviously a huge amount of concern um, about this right now that um, data has become, without any of us noticing, this sort of... Um, almost secret currency of the the modern economy and and we've been gaily accepting all these free services not realizing that we're we're giving up our our data and granting enormous power um, and uh, you know wealth to a few companies perhaps governments mm-hmm. um, do you recommend or see any way through this where it, it feels like in principle there's a mental flip that could be made and said that actually everyone is in the world even if they have no money mm-hmm. are actually a source of the value from their data they have they actually are an amazing data set even if they don't have any spending habits to mm-hmm. look at just their DNA their their health their condition in principle there's enormous value that the rest of humanity could benefit from if we could figure out a way of attributing the value that we get from data back to that individual mm-hmm. it could actually be an enormous um, uh, impetus for a Economic growth and perhaps part of the process for not creating a useless class after all mm-hmm. um, have you heard anyone talking convincingly about how that might be achieved yeah th- th- there is a lot of talk now about ownership of data and how to ensure that 
people not just own their data, but profit from their data being used. There, there is talk about a data tax. That part of the issue is that, I mean, we are used to an economy in which currency, in which money, dollars, euros, yens, is the main thing that is uh, being exchanged all the time. But we might be moving to a world in which the main thing that is being exchanged in more and more interactions is only information. So if you're thinking in terms of taxing dollars, you're missing most of what is happening in the economy. And it's not just, okay, let's try to put a dollar value on the information being transmitted. Again, you're missing the main point. Don't put a dollar value in it, put an information value in it. And maybe we need to have an information tax, which is not only a tax on information, it's a tax in information. Hmm. You need to pay in information. Uh, and we still don't have kind of the, the, even the, 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 the conceptual framework to deal with such an, a, an economy. I mean, you can figure out by implication approximations for the, for the value of people's data. And if you look at a company like Facebook, you know, it's, it's, it's something like a $55 billion revenue corporation mm -hmm. that comes from 2.3 billion users. I mean, in, in very rough average terms, it's making $25 per user. So there is, there is already the market is, is implying certain values. And what I, what I wonder is, is whether, given the pressure on tech companies now and the sort of the growing suspicion and the risk of government action and so forth, whether some of them might be persuaded or seduced into, into redefining their contract with their users mm -hmm. and actually saying, you know, here's the deal. We know that you are bringing us huge, huge value. We are giving you a service and we, and um, so we're already giving you that, but we may not be fully reflecting the value of the data you're giving us. Mm -hmm. We will be more transparent about this. You will have your own data account. And I, I, I feel like at some point, just as people move towards bank accounts containing money, at some point, there's going to need to be, you know, people, if people feel control over their data, I think the whole conversation changes. No, we don't, it's very hard to conceptualize what it means to, to own and control your data. We have thousands of years of experience in ownership of land. So it's easy to conceptualize. I own this piece of land. I build a fence around it. There is a gate. I decide who goes in, who goes out. Very easy to conceptualize. What does it mean that I own, let's say, the, the, my medical data, my DNA, like my, my most private data possible, my DNA code? It's mine. Okay, what does it mean? I mean, unlike land, which you have just one copy of a field, it's in one place, you can't move it, you can't transmit it, nothing. With DNA, okay, I have a printout of my DNA, wonderful. It, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, there can be a billion copies of my DNA in all kinds of clouds and, and, and computers and whatever. Uh, it can be used in so many ways which I don't understand. So we, we are very far from understanding what it means to mm. own your, your DNA and to have uh, reasonable models for how to allow usages that I want, like access to my uh, doctor from usages that I don't want. Uh, so, so this is one problem. The other problem is that we are now in a, in a situation when the, the, the data of individual people is very valuable because it is used to hack the humanity and to train AI. But this is not going to stay like this for long. Once the AI is trained, and once humanity is hacked, the data of individual people is going to decrease drastically. Mm. And it's important because we already figured out this animal. So the, the, the next billion people, we don't really need their data anymore. No, not, not, not as much. Now is the critical time. And the really important thing about what's being accumulated, especially in the US and in China, is um, the ability to hack human beings. Okay, and so, this is worth trillions and trillions, <laughs> not billions. So th this is an alarming phrase, right? The ability to hack human beings. Give, yeah. give me an example of that. What are you talking about? In the abstract, the ability to hack human beings means the ability to understand humans better than they understand themselves, which means being able to predict their choices better than they can predict their choices, being able to manipulate their emotions, being able to make decisions for them. Now, it should be very clear, we are not talking about knowing humans perfectly. 
Hmm. That's absolutely impossible, never going to happen. We're just talking about the ability to know you better than you know yourself, which is not so difficult because most people know very little about themselves. And by the way, that's not all bad, right? Mm -hmm. for, for technology to know that. I mean, let's say I'm feeling cranky and suddenly up on my screen, it, it pops up a note saying, hey, go to the fridge and drink product X, mm -hmm. you know, and you drink it and, oh, I feel better. That's, that's yeah. awesome. I did not know that, that my problem was this particular deficiency. You didn't drink enough. You're, you're yeah. dehydrated. Very simple. <laughs> so, so, I mean, p p part of it is good. And, and, and some of what frustrates me about the current conversation is that, you know, that talks about, ooh, the risk of, you know, behavioral manipulation and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, is that this has been part of economic life for years. Like the, the amount that television companies extracted per hour of user attention mm -hmm. could be higher than Facebook and Google and so forth are, are extracting now. No, it's not completely new. Nothing is ever completely new in history. There are always precedents. So people talk about genetic engineering. Well, we have been breeding cows and chickens for thousands of years. So what's new? Um, there, there, there is something new. What's new? I mean, the, maybe to imagine it, the borderline is the skin. Previously, almost all the information gathered on you was outside your skin. Where you go, what you buy, what you watch, what you press on your or TV, what you press on your keyboard. This is the, the information that flowed. But the future is about going under your skin and looking directly at what is happening in your heart, in your brain, what is your blood pressure, which parts of your brain are activated now. And this can be done either with invasive technologies like uh, electrodes implanted inside your body, but more and more with external devices from a, a ring or a bracelet on your arm, which measures biometric points of, of information. Or um, there are now devices that just by looking at your face from a camera, they can tell what's happening to your blood pressure, to your heart rate, things like that. And this is extremely good clues for understanding your emotional state. So it can go in the direction of, uh, you know, full-blown totalitarian regimes, like North Korea forcing every citizen in, say, 10 years or 20 years to wear a biometric bracelet, which constantly monitors not where you go and what you say. It monitors what's happening in your heart and in your brain. If you walk into a room and there is a picture of Kim Jong-un on the wall and the bracelet picks up the, the signs of anger because it has access to your brain, uh, that's very bad news for you. Mm. Even George Orwell's 1984, they couldn't really get into your brain. There was still this sphere of, of, of a private world. And, and this is about to disappear. In the West, the main concern now is what is known as surveillance capitalism. That, okay, um, it's not a kind of dictator that, that spies on your brain, but you have all these corporations and maybe all these government agencies which are monitoring what's happening inside your body. I mean, what does it mean to live mm. in a world when your inner reality is so completely exposed? I mean, I, I don't know what you make of the, the, the term surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as a, as a super powerful label to denigrate this whole tendency or, you know, to use data for, uh, to create economic value, if you like. Um, the companies who are behind it, I dare say, would say, you know what, you're kind of misunderstanding it. That's what it's like when it's misused. But really, we think of it as empowerment mm -hmm. capitalism. Like In your mind, what is, what is the trade-off between the good potential and the evil potential of, of this? There is enormous good potential. We could provide the best healthcare in the world and the cheapest healthcare in the world for billions of people uh, with this kind of technology. And this is why it's so tempting. Mm. Uh, if there was no, no good side, then it was very easy. L let's just not do it. But there are enormous beneficial, uh, and there are also great dangers. I mean, it's easy to think in terms of, oh, you have all these evil corporations or governments which will abuse this power in order to manipulate and control people in horrible ways. Intellectually, it's, it's easy to grasp that, that that's wrong. We should prevent it. But the really difficult stuff is what happens if it's not abused? What happens if there is a system that monitors me 
monitors my heart, my brain all the time, and is, is, is relatively benign, and is, it is used to provide me not only with better health care, but with constant guidance in life in almost every decision I make. We tend for thousands of years to view life as a drama of decision making. Hmm. Life is a journey. We reach intersection after intersection. We need to make decisions, financial decisions, romantic decisions, political decisions. What happens if in more and more intersections, you just rely on the advice of this algorithm that knows you so well and is really a benign algorithm? Hmm. So, it, it, you know, in the financial realm, I, I need to make decisions about where to invest my money, let's say. But this algorithm knows me so well that when I am about to make a wrong decision, like I read something on the news, I'm frightened, let's sell all my portfolio. And the algorithm knows, oh, this is a bad decision. Your mind is now being irrational. You shouldn't do it. And we learn from experience that this second brain that follows me is usually better than my organic brain. Hmm. So I give the bank an order. If what I tell you conflicts with what this uh, second brain, the algorithm tells you, don't do what I tell you. Do what the algorithm is telling you. If you do what I tell you, I'll sue you because <laughs> I know that the algorithm is better than me. So you, you're on the phone with your banker and you're screaming, sell my portfolio. And the banker says, no, 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 no. You told us not to believe you if the algorithm says no. And we believe the algorithm. And maybe after two hours, you come down and you say, ah, that's so good that the banker didn't listen to me. Now, what happens when the same thing also repeats itself in the romantic field? That you want to marry somebody and the algorithm says, no, that's a bad idea. You should marry somebody else. And we learn by experience to trust the algorithm. I mean, what kind of life is it <laughs> when more and more of these decisions are taken by the algorithms? We have no religious, artistic or philosophical model for understanding such a life. So talk more about this. Like, what do you have any guidelines to suggest about the things that are precious that we must hold on to and actually must not even start the process of outsourcing to technology? Ah, oh, that, that, that's the big question. One of the big problems is how do you define the goal? The financial algorithm, that's easy. I want more money. So uh, if you define the goal in, in, in such simple terms, the algorithm knows what to do. When, it, when you reach something like the romantic field or like what to study in university, then who defines the goal? Mm. Now, part of the problem is that who defines the goal today? I mean, how do I define today my romantic goals or my career goals? I mean, it's not that humans are doing it perfectly now and the algorithms will do a much worse job. Humans are doing a terrible job now. It's true. So, so <laughs> you know, it, it goes back to the most ancient philosophical and spiritual questions of getting to know yourself, of what is good, what is the good life, and... I cite a lot in these days that ancient philosophical questions are now becoming practical questions of engineering. Mm. So if you lived in ancient Greece or ancient India and you uh, have this debate about what is the good life or what is a good relationship? I don't know, Socrates and, and his, his, his fellow Athenians discussing this. So most people aren't involved in this discussion. Mm. And they just live their life in any, any way that they, they, I mean, in, in a haphazard way. They survive. Yeah, they somehow metal through. And there is an, an even deeper issue here, which is that self-reflection and self-exploration is just much more difficult and painful than people often imagine. They think, oh, okay, we'll have more time and technology will help us and we'll explore ourselves and this will be wonderful. Well, they imagine themselves like, again, in ancient Athens, walking with Socrates and having these interesting discussions or sitting for meditation and having all these experiences of bliss and oneness with the universe and wonderful. And part of the problem and part of the reason that until today, most people did not embark 
on a serious journey of self-exploration during their life is that it's far, far more complicated and painful from that. You start exploring yourself, you discover many things you don't like about yourself. You don't have these experiences of bliss and oneness with the universe. Well, maybe sometimes you do. But most of the time, you have these experiences of pain and anger and loneliness and all kinds of things that you don't want to confront. They are there inside. So I think we reach a point in human history when technology is forcing us to do this inner spiritual quest all we are going to pay a much higher price mm. for not knowing ourselves than ever before. And this is not going to be easy. Well, you, you strongly recommend meditation. It's something that's become a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, talk, talk about that. Well, I, I meditate. I do Vipassana meditation, which I've learned from Essen Goenka. I meditate for two hours every day, almost every day. That's an amazing time investment. I mean, uh, you, you it's really worth think that every you... second. <laughs> And, and I, I, my yearly vacation is to go on a long retreat of between, say, 30 days and 60 days. I just came back last month from a 60 days meditation retreat. Give, us, give, give me one, like a sense of an insight that you got during that 60 days. So just to give, or, or just something that, that justified to you the value of that, that time. Oof. <laughs> well, you can't understand what's happening today in the world with the attention economy if you don't observe what's happening to your own attention every moment. That like the simplest meditation instruction is just, you know, the simplest thing in the world. Just bring your attention to your breath mm. and just feel when the breath is coming in and when the breath is going out and do that for a few minutes. It's not a breath exercise. You're not trying to control the breath. You just try to feel, to notice, oh, now the breath is coming in and now the breath is going out. That's it. And this was like when I went to my first meditation course, this was the instructions of, on the first evening. And I was absolutely shocked that I can't do it for more than 10 seconds without my attention wandering away. Anybody who wants to understand the debate today about the attention economy and what's happening with... Uh, 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 Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and all that, if you don't take the time to observe your own attention in, 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 in real life, in actual experience, you won't understand that. Mm. And to realize, you know, I was doing my PhD in Oxford. I thought I was a very smart person. I have full control of my life. Nobody can manipulate me. And I couldn't focus my attention for 10 seconds on my own breath without some thought, emotion, memory popping up and hijacking my attention to some, some, some story, some fantasy. And it made me realize I have no idea what is actually happening in my mind. I have almost no control over my attention. And that's kind of the beginning of the journey. Hmm. T to what extent, Yuval, is our very language misleading here? Like, all of our language is about you, me, you know, it's my, my attention. You say, know thyself. And we often say things like, you know, that that's just who I am. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, it's very helpful to think of myself as this sort of um, chaotic mix of personalities, ideas, thoughts, battling it out in there. It's, it's kind of like this mad you know, yeah, wriggling, wriggling, <laughs> wriggling mess of, of all these different hopes and insights and thoughts and, um, and different situations empower different parts of me. Exactly. Um, and, and parts of me I, I, I don't like very much. Mm -hmm. And you espouse this really powerfully in the book that part of the insight of meditation is a sort of gradual letting go of, of sense of self and a kind of almost a humility that there's just a lot more going on in there and that our language is deceiving us a lot, yeah. of, a lot of the time. Yeah, language and religion and ideology uh, deceive us. They give us this idea of, of a unitary entity, that's me, and encourage us to identify with whatever thought or emotion that pops up in the mind. If I think something, well, this is me. I think this, I chose to think this thought, it reflects who I am. If I feel some emotions, the same thing, it's, I, I chose to feel that. If I choose to buy something, to do something, all oh, that's my free will. And when you meditate and you explore what's actually happening inside, you realize this is a complete illusion. 
Uh, I have very little control usually over many of the processes inside me. So let's say I sit for meditation for one hour and I want to experience this peace and tranquility. I tell myself, oh, you came here to, to meditate, to relax, to, to experience peacefulness and, and oneness. So just let all the thoughts go away and just focus on your breath. Hmm. And I do that for 10 seconds and then something pops up. Like I published an article and there was some other professor who criticized it and this comes in the mind and I become very angry and I, I said, not, that's not the right time to think. I, I want mm. peace now. Let Go away. And it comes back again and again and then something about the Israeli election which really upsets me comes up <laughs> and I lose my temper and I have all these uh, dystopian scenarios about this will happen and I tell myself, stop all this noise. I just want some peace. And at the end of the one hour, I say, oh, this was a terrible hour of meditation. I couldn't get any peace. But actually, it was a wonderful hour of meditation. I actually observe what's happening inside and how little control I have over these things. And I also observe the kind of buttons and and levers that outside forces can pull inside my mind. This is how it works. Okay, so let's let's try and connect some of the dots here. Um, you think that where technology is going, the issues that it's pushing us to contemplate means that it's essential that we know ourselves better. We have to start mm-hmm. there. If we don't know ourselves better, we will not even be able to have the conversation around what do we outsource to technology and what do we absolutely not. Yeah. You know, if we're not careful, we will outsource the things that are most precious to us. Mm-hmm. And one of the key conversations, therefore, about the future, uh, which needs to be anchored in this better sense of who we are, is data. Yes. uh, And again, connecting the dots. I don't want anybody to see what I just told you. I mean, this experience of sitting there for one hour with all these crazy thoughts and emotions in my mind, I don't want anybody to access that. Because I know that if somebody could access that, they could manipulate me in ways which were never possible before in in history. Mm. And I don't want my spouse to be really able to see what's happening in my mind. I don't want my neighbor, because there is such a crazy world inside and my power over it is so limited that it will be very, very dangerous Mm. to allow outsiders this kind of access. Uh, Whether a government, whether a corporation, whether an an organization, it's it's very delicate. So you've all, there's one thing that comes out in your book that I found ex- extremely powerful and hopeful, which is that you point out that um, even though technology is showing signs of being more intelligent than us in many ways, it's not showing any sign at all of being sentient, i.e. Yes. feeling anything. Mm-hmm. Um, the assumption in a lot of scientific writing, a lot of thought about AI is that, of course, those things must go together. Historically, that's been the case. But I, I've seen more and more deep thinkers actually say that that's not clear. Mm -hmm. Like if the ability to feel something was just a consequence of complex information processing, then Google would already be conscious probably. It's got Mm -hmm. so much, you know, going on there. So is there any scenario where we could write ourselves back into this story in quite an important way as being the only things in the universe that we know of that are actually capable of the things that matter most in the universe, mm-hmm. i.e. love, joy, creativity, the sort of the, that feeling of peace you talked about. Technology can't advise us on what are the things deepest in our hearts. We should not let it. We should retain control. In fact, make our technology in service to those things. And in a sense, the relationship between technology and us, they, they, it should regard sentient things as gods mm-hmm. that, that, that have superpowers that it knows nothing of. No? Is that, is that ridiculous? Yeah, I think that the question of sentience and consciousness is the most important question in, in this regard, and it's the greatest riddle in science. We don't understand consciousness. We don't understand sentience. Uh, it's not just humans, of course. It's also other animals. We don't understand the consciousness and sentience of monkeys, of pigs, of cows. Uh, and it is the most important question we face. Uh, thing is that engineers and investors are impatient people. They can't wait until we figure out this thing of consciousness. So they use proxies. 
like, okay, we want to improve human experience. What does it mean? We don't understand. So let's put a proxy on it, time in front of screens. I mean, it goes back to the idea that the customer is always right. If people spend more time in front of the screen, that means they are having a good experience, uh, uh, mission accomplished. Mm. And this is an extremely poor philosophical foundation. And I think that's the biggest problem in Silicon Valley and in the entire technological revolution that we are seeing, that the technology and the engineering is incredible hmm. and the philosophy is sometimes very childish. Indeed, but some people listening to this will go, okay, you, you've gone all philosophical on us and um, the world can't <laughs> yeah, the, the, the world we can't impatient. afford that for now. It's impatient. We've got some, we've got some bigger things to worry about. So, so let's look at some of those bigger things. You know, thinking as a historian, mm -hmm. you said that we are currently down to sort of no stories. That that old story of liberalism has been broken by the sort of um, disillusionment of the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So, what now? Why does it matter that we don't have a story now? Maybe we just muddle along for a bit. What happens? What are you worried about could happen? The worst problem is that we are confronting uh, some major global threats and we need to act on them. I mean, if we could have the time for, you know, a couple of decades of just humanity on a journey of soul searching and who we are and where do we go from here, then, then fine. But we just don't have this luxury. We don't have the time. We have climate change. We have the threat of nuclear war still there. People forgot, oh, it was in the 60s. No, it's still today. There are still nukes around, a lot of them. And we have this problem we have been talking a lot about of disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence disrupting the job market, the economy, bioengineering disrupting the, the human body itself. And we need global cooperation on all these issues if we are to solve them or, or to prevent the worst outcomes. And without a common story, we don't have global cooperation. Again, large-scale human cooperation is built on shared stories and fictions and mythologies. And, and you would include, in, as examples of that, um, everything from like a, a, a religion, uh, maybe even a local superstition, through to things like the American dream mm -hmm. or, or even human rights. As yeah, a, as I mean, a, as a, human rights are not a biological fact. They are a story we have constructed. Now, when I say that something is, is a fiction or a myth or a story, it doesn't mean that it's evil or that it's a lie or that it is bad. Uh, there are good stories and bad stories. I mean, the way to measure, to decide whether a story is good or bad is its impact in the world. Some stories are wonderful and some stories are terrible. But isn't, like, I, I think... One criticism I've occasionally heard of your work is that there's like there's a sort of breathtaking uh, power in sort of connecting, you know, the fiction of human rights with the fiction of believing in the god Goo Goo who is hidden behind that rock <laughs> and who is going to throw thunderbolts at you. Mm -hmm. um, and both may have served a purpose in their time. But is it possible that you're not doing enough to differentiate different types of fiction that, yes, they may all be useful in, in their moment to build cooperation, but isn't it also possible that some of these stories are actually truer than others? Is there, like, if you believe in truth, mm -hmm. can't you also say that stories over time are at least capable of becoming truer or more useful? So, for example, science. Like, I don't want to believe that science is just another story. No, that science even... isn't. I mean, we, we need to differentiate two things types of power right. in history. You have the power over objective reality, like to build bridges or cure diseases or building an atom bomb. And then you have the power over humans and their subjective feelings or imagination, making them believe in something. Now, for most activities, you need both. Let's say you want to build an atom bomb. So on the one hand, you need a good theory of physics. If you don't understand physics well enough, you will not be able to build an atom bomb. And here, we are not dealing with fictional stories. We are dealing with more accurate or less accurate scientific theories. And I, I definitely believe in scientific objectivity and truth in that sense. But on the other hand, in order to build an atom bomb, a good understanding of physics is not enough. You also need people to cooperate, 
to mine uranium and build reactors and, and clean after you, uh, the, all the scientists have lunch, so somebody needs to clean the dishes. You need people to cooperate on this. And for that, you need a story. You will not get millions of people cooperating by telling them E equals MC square. Now let's build an atom. No, why? And the story you tell them need not be true at all. It could be complete nonsense. And still it would be effective in making them cooperate. Now still, I would say there are good stories and bad stories you can tell people in that situation. The measurement would be how much suffering it causes or alleviates. So, so something, therefore, something like human rights, which is a human construction and in one sense a fiction, but as measured by an attempt to alleviate suffering, is actually... It was a very good story. A really powerful story. Yes. Yeah. Not just powerful, but, but a very good one. But it's also dangerous to confuse a story we have constructed in a particular historical setting and think that we can just apply it to any other historical period or to any other political and geographical location today in the world. Yuval, why is it, do you think, that your way of thinking about the world has resonated so powerfully in Silicon Valley? Like so many people I know mm. who are in the tech world really view you as this sort of epic source of wisdom. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I've heard several theories, <laughs> some more flattering than others about why this is the case. Well, uh, so here's a possible flattering one and an unflattering one. A flattering okay. one would be that you're one of the few historians who really seems to get technology and the, and the power of it. So I think they respect that. But uh, perhaps the unflattering explanation is that almost that you're letting them off the hook because you go with, you know, this is almost inevitable and our response to it should be to understand ourselves better, and then what happens next is not clear. Whereas there's a lot of people out there saying, wait a sec, you know, the world is about to be blown up by some of the technologies we're doing. Shouldn't you be calling for a revolution, calling for, you know, the firewall to be erected around California or, 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 mm -hmm. or something? People are annoyed at you at being too calm in your recommendations about what we should do. Usually I get the criticism that I'm far too pessimistic than, <laughs> and not that I'm calm, <laughs> but... I think that you, you can't just stop all research and development of, of, of technology, of AI, of bioengineering. And even if you do it in one country, other countries will not do that. So I, I don't think that we have the option of just saying these developments are extremely dangerous, let's stop. I mean, one of the things you, you suggest we do is to replace some of our anger at the current situation with, with what you call bewilderment. Yeah. What, what did you mean by that? I mean that when, when, when you're panicking or when you're very angry, you think you understand what is happening. And I think it's a better place to be in if you realize, wait a minute, the truth is I don't really understand what is happening in the world. I don't have these ready-made answers. And part of the appeal of populists and authoritarian kind of father figures today is that people are frightened, are confused, and you have this person coming and saying, I know everything, just trust in me. I will make everything okay. And that's extremely dangerous. It's difficult, but I think it's important to just stay with the bewilderment and confusion, not forever, because we need to take action, but at least for, for, for some time. I mean, there's a humility in that, I think, isn't there? Like if everyone on left and right, for example, instead of getting more and more outraged at each other, mm -hmm. we just said, actually, I, I don't know the answer to that. And um, I would like to know. Like you could picture a, a shift in tone of the conversation yeah. of people trying to learn from each other instead of trying to judge each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see any chance of that happening? Where, where actually are you on the optimism, pessimism um, spectrum? I would try to kind of summarize my, 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 my views like that. Um, Things today are better than ever for humanity. Things are still quite bad and things can get much, much worse. So I'm not an optimist because I think that, yes, things are bad and they can get much worse. But I'm not a pessimist either because I think that things are better. 
than previously in history, which means that it is possible to improve the situation. It's really still up to us. We still have the time and the ability to, to make a change, a change for the better. Well, the stories we tell ourselves is going to play a key part in that. What story would you like to inject into the minds of people listening that uh, um, might make a difference? I would tell the listeners that there is now a race, a competition to hack humanity in general and to hack you in particular. And you should make the effort to stay ahead of your competitors, of the big corporations, the governments that are trying to hack you. So you need to get to know yourself better uh, because there are now these forces that are trying to hack you. It's not like the old days. You know, philosophers have been telling people to get to know yourself better for thousands of years. But in the past, in the days of Socrates or Buddha, you did not have real competition. Now you have competition. You need to stay ahead. And, you know, meditation is just one way to do it. For other people, psychological therapy works. For some people, art is the best way to get to know themselves. For some people, sports or taking a long hike. Whatever works for you, invest in that. Do that because you must stay ahead of the competition. If they get to know you better than you know yourself, it's game over for you. And if I might add, Yuval, I mean, one thing I've learned from you is, is just how much narratives matter. And it feels like that there's so many narratives going around today that we are telling ourselves that aren't helping humans cooperate better. They're actually quite destructive. Um, and any advice for people on how to pay attention to the narratives in your mind and maybe improve those narratives to av avoid that risk? Yeah, that, that goes back to the, to the first suggestion of getting to know yourself better, because getting to know yourself better often means getting to know the stories in your mind. The stories that could be personal stories about your own life and childhood and personality and whatever, and they could be religious and nationalist and ideological stories. And if you really take the time to get to know the stories inside yourself and what they are doing to you, I think this is kind of the best inoculation against the worst stories around. Because the stories that harm humanity usually start by harming you. Mm. That they kind of amplify, turn up the volume of the angry voices in your mind, in your head. They turn up the volume of the fearful voices in your head. And fear and anger and hatred, they harm you long before they harm anybody else. Hmm. If you walk around all day with all these hateful and fearful voices in your mind, this destroys your peace of mind long before it harms anybody else. And we are living in a world where there are many people and many organizations that try to send their hand into our brain and find the, the, the volume button and put up the volume of the hate and of the fear voices. And if you can actually see it happening and what it does to you, that's the best defense against these external hands that are being sent all the time into your brain, into your mind. Well, Yuval, um, what an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for this, this time and for all your thinking about this. Here's hoping for, I don't know, a wiser future with better <laughs> stories told. Thanks yeah. so much, Yuval. Thank you. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Do consider writing a brief review of the TED interview on Apple iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Those reviews are influential, actually, and we certainly read every word. This show was produced by Sharon Mashihi. Our editorial director is Michelle Quint. Production manager is Roxanne High Lash. Mix engineer, David Herman. And our theme music is by Alison Leighton Brown. Thanks for listening. On the next episode, best-selling author Johan Hari 
He shares his personal experience with depression and his journey to discover both its causes and solutions. It is not the trauma that destroys you. It is the shame about the trauma. And giving people safe places to release that shame is an antidepressant. That's next time on The TED Interview.